God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. Clever just remind me that I misspelled sweet. <laughs> I did misspell it too. I'm, I can't change it until after the show is over with. So it's not supposed to be sweat smell. That's, that's nasty. That's not going to smell too good. It's sweet smell. So I'm going to <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to change that after the... <laughs> After it goes, after I, uh, um, after the live show goes, it won't let me change it until after the show goes off. So I did misspell sweet. I'll be typing so fast. I'm saying I don't check it beforehand. But I'll, I'll correct it. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Clever, for uh, bring, pointing that to me because I wouldn't have caught it until next week. I'll be looking and I'll say, oh my God, I misspelled that. Good to see everybody today. Hope everybody's doing fantastic today. Good to see all of you. Hope all is well with you. Uh, Christine Meadows, but well, thank you. I want to thank you again, Christine Meadows, for that great contribution you gave to me. Uh, you bless my soul with that. God bless you, my sister. I hope everything is fantastic with you and the family. Hope God bless you even more uh, for that. Sister Brittany, good to see you. My sister, hope everything is well with you and the family. God bless you. Brother JLC, God bless you, brother. Hope everything is good. I heard people be having a cool front coming in. I wouldn't call it a cold front, but a cool front coming in. Brother Eric, the welder. Matter of fact, he called me this morning <laughs> while I was studying here. Good to see you that Eric, the welder. Lisa Bakes, good to see you, my sister. Lisa out of Illinois. God bless you. Hope you and the family is doing well also. Um, Brother Howard, good to see you, big boy Howard. Howard is in the house. Good to see you, brother. Hope you and the family is doing well too. Uh, <laughs> Jesse said, don't sweet <laughs> N-E-T. <laughs> don't sweet it. <laughs> Yeah, sweet. I, I don't know what I was thinking about. Uh, <laughs> uh, and good to see my darling, uh, Clever. Uh, thank you for that. Bring that to my attention. I should have let you spell check it before I actually posted it. Because I will misspell a word. And sometimes I get a hurt. I do a, it'd be an auto check and it wouldn't even check me. And it just let me go. But sometimes it catches it. But sometimes I'm typing and not looking at it. But we'll get, we'll get it straightened up. After the uh, show is over today, now we're gonna be, we're gonna be in the uh, the gospel according to uh, John chapter twelve, and we're gonna start at verse one. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead, and there they made a supper. Martha served, but Lazarus was made them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spinnard, very costly, anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then said one of his disciples, Judas, as a cara, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? He's so concerned about the poor. Does this sound familiar to anybody? These politicians pretending like they care about the poor. Verse 6 says, This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put in therein. Then said Jesus, Let her alone against the day of, bur of my burying, had she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him, Many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. And we want to talk about true worship brings with it a sweet smell. Not a sweat smell. It's a sweet smell. It brings about a sweet smell. Yes, it does. Now, you notice 
in the particular text that they said, we're going to kill Lazarus too. You get so close to Jesus and you start walking with Jesus, other people start believing the devil want to kill you. I know they find that shocking. The devil will want to kill you because of uh, who you are associated with. When you are associated with the master, you become the enemy of the devil. Now, make no mistake about that. You are become the enemy of the devil. Now, Romans chapter 12 and 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Ephesians 5 and 2 says, And walk in love as Christ also had loved us and had given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. True worship has little to do with outside performance. I'm going to put a pen in there. You may want to think about that. I mean, you may catch that a little bit later. It may like, it's like a grenade. You throw it and you count to like, what is it? Three, four, five, six. Boom, it blows up. I'm going to repeat it. This grenade, just in case you didn't catch it or you get it in your spirit. True worship has little to do with outside performance. Now, it doesn't matter. There's nothing wrong with outside performance. But true worship has very little little to do with outside performance. You can jump up and sing from the sh swing from the chandeliers. You can run up and down the church, do your so-called holy dance, but if there's nothing on the inside, all you're doing is dancing. You're dancing, dancing, dancing machine. Watch you get down, watch you get down, watch you toot, 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 toot. That's what you're doing. You're just dancing. You're not conducting yourself in true worship. You don't have, see, true worship is from the heart. It's the mind, the spirit. True worship starts with the innermost part of a person's being. Has little to do with outside performance. See, you can go to church and people be jumping all off stuff. Oh my God, we had church up in there. They leave, don't nothing change. They act the same way. Ain't nothing changed in 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Most of the people go to the same church. Can't even get along with the people in the church they going along with. But they just, they jumping off the chandelier. We had church. We did a holy dance. The Lord don't care if you do that. You're going to see when we start dealing with it. The problem is, is that it ain't true worship going on. True worship will always consider the one whom you are praising. It takes into account if that if the person is worthy of such lofty praises. See, maybe that may be the problem. Some of y'all don't think the Lord is worthy of praise. That's why y'all be giving fake worship. You will see in our text that Mary had high and exalted worship for the Lord. She thought highly of him. We don't think highly of the Lord. That's why we want to give him anything. When we spend time with him, we want to just give him anything. He don't want anything. Ain't the way he operates. Just keep it to yourself then. Have you ever heard somebody just give you a gift and want to throw something to you? If you're going to give me a gift, throw it. I don't want it. No, I don't want that kind of gift. That's the thing if you... If you got a uh, a person that you want to, you say they really special to you, and you just you get some some toilet paper and some newspaper, and you wrap that gift up and 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 and, and uh, you throw it in the back of the trunk or something in your car. You may drop it in the mud or something. You say I really was thinking of you. This is a gift I really want to give you. It means a lot to me to give it to you. You don't mean that. You don't mean that. Uh uh. You don't mean that. See. Your view of God will determine the way you praise him. I'm preaching now. I say your view of God will determine the way you praise him. Psalm, if, if you ever read Psalm 150, it ain't but six verses in Psalm 150. But listen to Psalm 150. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with sophistry and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with string instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that had breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. 
This is the mindset of Mary in our text. She said, with all my fiber, with all my being, I've been saving up for this worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. She does not care who might be looking. She's not concerned with what the crowd is thinking. She's not concerned with what others are doing. Her sole reason for coming into the house of Simon the leopard was to worship the master. She came to give the Lord Jesus his flowers while he was still alive. I like that. I said she came to give him his flowers while he was still alive. This is nothing, I don't think there's nothing wrong with giving people flowers at the funeral or after death, but I believe that we should give people their flowers when they too can smell the flowers. Oh, yes, indeed, I'm talking to somebody. See, everybody wants to wait somebody to die and tell them all the good things they think about. No, uh-uh. No, no, let them hear what you got to say. Why are you going to wait till they pass away? They can't hear it. Seems to me you just showing out for somebody else. No, give them their flowers while they are living. It's okay if you want to go down and put flowers on the on the grave when people die. I never got that. My parents, my mom used to do it. My grandma, all them did and stuff. Whereas a boy, I used to always think to myself, can, can, grandma, can, can grandma, can great grandma see them flowers y'all putting on the grave? I just never got the concept. I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with it. Don't get mad at me because I know everybody does it. They go down to the grave. They be putting all kind of flowers, but the person in the grave can't see it. You can honor them without doing it. I'm not telling you not to do it. Don't get mad at me because people get mad. You try to tell them what to do. My grandma did it. My grandma did it. I'm not telling you not to do it. But I hope you gave them their flowers while they were still here. Because I don't want you to give me a bunch of flowers when I'm dead. I can't see it. I like to sniff roses too. I want to sniff my roses while I'm here, while I'm on this side of glory. There's nothing wrong with giving people flowers at the funeral, but please give me some flowers while I'm alive. You always bragging on somebody, but you bragging on people when they can't hear. Let them hear sometimes. Now I like to say also, when you worship the Lord with genuine worship, not everyone will approve of that true worship. Some people may say it don't take all of that. Some may say you are just showing out and you want to be seen. But this is the, the same Mary who had a brother named Lazarus. Are you familiar with this Mary? Her mother had been dead for four days. She know who she's worshiping here. He has power over death. She understands who it is she is worshiping. And how worthy he is. You will notice that in the text. A fellow by the name of Judas. As a cara. You, are you familiar with this. This fellow Judas. I would name my child Judas. If I was you. Uh, because that is synonymous with a traitor. When you want to insult somebody. You say you ain't nothing but a Judas. Now Judas. He had a problem with Mary's worship. He says uh 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 uh. Because mm -mm, Judas is really looking out for the poor, but he's a thief. Now, Matthew and Mark doesn't call him a thief, but John does. John said, I'm not going to pull no punches with you. It had nothing to do with his concern about wasting uh, on Jesus. He was saying that, Jesus, you're not worthy of what Mary is doing for you. That's technically what he's saying. It, he he's he, he he did not feel that the Lord Jesus was worthy of such high worship and praise. In other words, he's saying, Mary, I dare you waste that. I was planning on stealing that money. He thought that money could be put in a better use, mainly in his pocket. <laughs> That's what this problem is right now. Come on and give to the preacher. Now, they mean come on and give. I mean, come on. The Lord wants you to give. The Lord wants this new building. The Lord wants this. Now, now you want it. You got two planes, five cars, three houses, and you're talking about the Lord wants it. The Lord don't live there. That's where you live. Judas was suffering from what many people in the church are suffering from. They don't really know the Lord, therefore, they cannot conduct themselves in true worship. You hear what I say? If you don't know him, how are you going to conduct in the proper worship when you have not got to know him. Once you get to know him, you ain't got no problem with praising him. Matter of fact, you can't help yourself. 
You know what I'm saying? You're not able to help yourself. When you hear certain songs of music, when you think about the goodness of the Lord, somebody almost got to restrain you from worshiping him. You ain't got to try to coach a true worshiper to worship. They just worship out of thankfulness of the Lord for what he's already done. What most people see as true worship is nothing more than a bunch of worldly activity. Yeah, I said it. There's nothing wrong with getting excited in your worship. Because I don't know how you can I get excited sometimes. Ain't nothing wrong with that. But if you are conducting yourself in true worship, there must be a change on the inside. You hear what I'm saying? I want to read something. You may hear this fella right here. His name is A.W. Tozer. He was a worshiper too. If you ever read anything on A.W. Tozer, I got a couple of books on him. I would advise to. So he got one called Worship. A little book called Worship. A little small book. In this book, I want to read something he says in there. This may offend some of y'all, but he's right about it. He says, there are many weird ideas about God in our day, and therefore there are all kinds of substitute for true worship. Often I've heard someone or another within the Christian church confess sadly. He said, this is what they say. I guess I don't really know very much about God. Then he says, if that is true confession, the man or woman should then be honest enough to make a necessarily parallel confession. I guess I don't really know very much about worship. Because if you don't know him, you don't know nothing about worship. I said it. I agree with A.W. Tozer, but he wasn't finished. He says, actually, basic beliefs about the person and nature of God have changed so much that there are among us now men and women who find it easy to brag about the benefits they receive from God without ever a thought or a desire to know the true meaning of worship. Preach, son. And then he goes on and says, he says, I have immediately reactions to such an extreme misunderstanding of the true nature of of a holy and sovereign God. He says, my first is that I believe that the very last thing God desires is to have shallow-minded, worldly Christians bragging about him. Preach A.W. Tozer. He don't need you, he don't need a bunch of heathens bragging on him. What you talking about? Then he says, my second is that it does not seem to be very well recognized that God's highest desire is that every one of his believing children should so love and adore him that we are continuously in his presence in spirit and in truth. That's a word right there. That'll preach right there, A.W. Tozer. That's what I'm talking about. Now, you will notice that our text says it was six days before the Passover. The Passover lamb had arrived at the house of Simon the leper. Come on, somebody. You hear what I say? Normally, you go get the Passover lamb. The Passover lamb has arrived at the house of Simon the leper. Now, some say that this particular Simon was the man that the master healed in Matthew chapter 8. But when we look at the text, this may be what Mary was thinking about when she came to worship. They're having a meeting at a leper's house. Well, could she be, or should we say a former leper? Because he met the master, he no longer has leprosy. Some of you have leprosy or had leprosy in the mind. Nobody wanted to be around you. But the master of your soul cured you of your leprosy. And now people don't mind being around you. Nobody used to become around a leopard. Her brother now, this is Mary's brother. Uh, uh, not, not the time in the leopard, but her brother was there whom she knew that the Lord had raised from the dead. Now think about what Mary is saying. Simon used to have leprosy. Met the master. You wouldn't really get very few people ever cured of leprosy in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Jesus shows up and he's regularly doing this. She's at the house of Simon the leper. They're throwing a shindig at his house. Her brother's there who was dead. And the master, she's seen the master perform all of these miracles. Simon the leper was hosting a dinner for the master. And just understand that in the old days, when you got leprosy, you died with leprosy. Come on. King Uzziah died with leprosy once he got it. Wasn't nobody to heal him. 
But the Passover lamb had come whom came to break all the chains that the fall had caused. I said the Passover lamb was passing through. Now in the Old Testament, in Exodus chapter 12, it talks about the Passover. Are you familiar? Passover. Understand what it means, Passover. The death angel passes over and you don't die. All the firstborn was said that they were going to die if he did not see the blood of the Passover lamb. Come on now. You're on your way to hell if you don't have the blood of the Passover lamb in your heart. The Passover lamb was pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. The lamb was a sort of scapegoat that the people were not punished for their sins. You know what a scapegoat is? You say, don't make me out your scapegoat. The scapegoat got the sin and the punishment. So in other words, the Lord Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, became our scapegoat. And the scapegoat, which is the Passover lamb, is dining at the house of Simon the leopard. And uh, Lazarus is there. Now, the holy rollers, these are the church folks. Some of the fakest people you can ever want to meet is these phony church folk. I can't stand phony church folk. They really don't love the Lord. They really ain't got no substance about them. What matter of fact, they got disdain for the Lord because whatever they want to pick out about blessings and stuff, oh, that applies to them. But whenever it comes about uh, taking a stand on doing the right thing or uh, being on the right side uh, of what the Lord requires, they don't want no part of that. I think the God is the God of love then. But the Passover lamb, he was here at Simon the leper's house. Everyone who had the blood from the lamb on their doorpost, the death angel would pass over their homes and the firstborn would not be killed. Are you familiar with that? So I think you want to eat of the Passover lamb. Now, the thing about the Passover lamb in the Old Testament, if you ever read it over in Exodus chapter 12, it says that what they would do is that if you had a smaller family, y'all would share a lamb. Thing I like about uh, my Passover lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, there's enough of that lamb to fill us all up. Yeah, his blood is sufficient. Now, maybe Mary was saying that the one whom Moses was pointing to, the one the, uh, the Lord had said was coming, he has arrived at the home of Simon the leper. She said, I want to get my worship on. The Lord Jesus spent his last day at the leper's home. What kind of, Jesus, don't you want to go to the castle? He spent his last days among leopards and sinners still healing until he was taken up to glory. I believe that Mary had been saving this very expensive ointment, especially for the master. Are you saving anything for the master or do you want to give him your leftovers? Do you give him the best of your time or the only time you talk to him or study with him or look at his words is when you're tired and sleepy and you're just going through the motions. I would read the Bible, but I'm kind of sleepy right now. I'm going to read it next week. No, you're not. No, you're not. You need to spend some time with him. It'll make you a better person. Let me tell you, it will, because it whips you into line. You need to get into it because one thing about the word of God, it makes you want to be a better person because the spirit of God talks to your spirit once you have uh, understood who he is and once you have been, as Jesus was selling Nicodemus, born again, uh, all of a sudden uh, true worship starts to kick in and the more time you spend with him in worship, the better off you feel about it. Now, in some ways, Mary can be seen as a sort of a prophet because the Lord says about Mary against the day of my burying, had she kept this. In other words, I don't think Mary would understand what she was doing, but she was looking past the grave. Let me anoint him right now. <laughs> he needs to be anointed now because he's the lamb that came to take the sins away. That's what John the Baptist was saying when he first saw him. That was the first thing he said, Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, Mary entered the home of Simon the leopard with the mindset that she was going to worship the Lord with all her heart. See, when you, that's when it says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. This is Mary right here. She says, Simon the leper's house is a house of worship now because the master has showed up. And wherever the master shows up, it's time for worship. She says, I'm going to enter into his presence with thanksgiving 
I'm going to enter into his courts with praise. I think the psalmist says, be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord is good. He's perpetually good. Now, true worship is a mindset that one must have in order to worship the Lord. That means you must get to know the God of scripture if you are to know him. Mary had been around the Lord and she knew his character. She knew it. Judas knew it too. But that boy got a devil in him, boy. Woo! I don't know how you can hang around the Lord for three years and do something like Judas. This was Judas' last straw. Technically, after this happened, after Jesus allowed Mary to worship, Judas says, I'm going to sell him out now. Says, you won't give me some of this money. I'm going to go get these 30 pieces of silver and I'm going to snitch on you. And later on, I'm going to pretend like I'm really upset about it. And I'm going to go throw it. I say, I don't think I betrayed him. No, no, uh-uh. Too late for that. You ain't remorseful. You remorse because you've been exposed. Mary had been around the Lord. She said his character is a flawless. That's what Mary was saying. She says, I've been waiting for this opportunity. <laughs> I've been waiting for the opportunity to anoint the one who was to come. He's the son of David, I think they said, seed of Abraham. I said, Mary says that I need to get in here and enter in, and I got some for the Lord. She said, I've been waiting for this one right here. Do you have a, a, a mindset of worship that you're going to worship him? He's worthy. People don't have a problem worshiping humans. It seems like they have a problem worshiping the true and holy God. You must have a hunger and a thirst after the true and living God in order to conduct yourself in true worship. If you look over in Psalm 42, are you familiar with Psalm 42? It's a beautiful song if you never read the songs. The songs are songs of praises. I don't know some of these songs. All you got to do is sing the song, and you can make a great song just singing the song. You may have to get a melody for that. Call me, I'll help you up with that melody. <laughs> Psalm 42 says, As the heart, that's the deer, Panted after the water brook, so panted my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? He's thirsty now. He's thirsty for the right thing. He says, wait a minute. He said, I'm just panting like the deer. I don't know if he saw a picture of a deer who was thirsty, just saying, I need some water. He says, as the deer panted after the water brook, so panted my soul after thee, O God. Then he says, my tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, where's your God? See, they'll start mocking you. He says, I thought you loved the Lord. Look how he's doing you. He don't even love you that much. That's what the devil comes to do. The devil comes and say, the Lord don't really care about you. He don't care nothing about you. He wouldn't let you suffer like this if he cared anything about you. That's how the devil works. You said, Calvary shows me that he cares for me. Huh. You can't tell me he don't care for me. Look at Calvary. Suffering is temporary. You better hear me. I said, just like uh, your tears are just temporary. That used to be a song. Your tears are just temporary relief. Your tears. <laughs> now, it also says that when I I went with them into the house of God uh, with a voice of joy. See, enter it with joy and praise with a multitude that kept holy day. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? He's talking to himself. And why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God? For I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. O oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan. See, this is a fellow whose mindset. And I like what he says about in verse 7 of Psalm 42. He says, deep call it to deep at the noise of thy water sprouts. All thy waves and thy billows are going over me. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime and in the night his song shall be with me and my prayer unto the God of my life. This is a person desiring true and a living God. He wants to worship him from the heart and soul. When you are a true worshiper, you will miss when you are not able to worship with true believers. Uh, you ain't gonna miss the fake believers. I'm saying when you really want to get down with some worship, when you really are understanding, whenever you have 
genuine worship, it does something for the soul. The good news for those who seek the Lord, you will find him. I got news for you. You say, I was looking for the Lord. Don't worry. If you're looking for him, he ain't hard to find. <laughs> I guarantee you, if you're really searching him with your whole heart, you can find him. The only reason you don't find him is that you really don't want to have true worship. I'm talking to somebody. Don't tell me you can't find him. He ain't hiding from you. I was looking for the Lord, but he just ain't answering me. Stay there. Stay there. He wants to see how bad you want it. Now, I don't know if you want it bad. I think you're just talking like you really want to get to know him. You don't really want to get to know him. If you go with Isaiah 55, it says, Seek ye the Lord while ye may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways and let the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abund uh, abundantly pardon. The Lord has ordained what he wants and desires as true worship. Making the Lord in your image will not lead to true worship. Did you hear what I say? You says, they ain't the Lord I know. Do you know the Lord of the Bible? Uh, making the Lord in your image will not lead to true worship. The God is holy. Oh, he's holy. He's high and exalted. And if you get a glimpse and understand the holiness of God, it will bring you to make you want to just melt in your skin. Everybody who has encountered the holy God, you don't sit there arrogant and say, well, he ain't as holy as I thought. No, no. You come undone. Anytime you get a glimpse of him, you come undone. In heaven, they, the angels are even afraid to look on a holy God. They're flying around heaven, covering up their feet and their eyes and stuff, just singing the song over and over and over. Holy, holy, holy is God in the third power. He's real holy. There can be deadly consequences when we decide to worship the Lord in a way he has not preordained. I'm going to repeat that. Did you, are you listening now? Hold on a minute. I got to get a drink of water for this one because I got to repeat that. I said, there can be deadly consequences when we decide to worship the Lord in a way he has not preordained. They said, what you talking about? What you talking about, Willis? Uh, I'm glad you asked, Willis. There's a story in 2 Samuel, the sixth chapter. David wanted to honor the Lord by bringing the Ark of the Covenant up to Jerusalem. Are you familiar with that particular story? You can read it in uh, 2 Samuel, the sixth chapter. And it gives some more details in, uh, I think it's 1 Chronicles 15, if I'm not mistaken. It gives some more details. David wanted to honor the Lord by bringing the Ark of the Covenant up to Jerusalem. David had all the right intentions, I believe. David was doing this with the right motives and the right intentions. And the people who was involved had the right mindset and the right intentions. His heart was in the right place. But guess what? Your heart can be in the right place. But you need to consult God's word to see if that's what he wants you to do. There's just one simple problem with your heart being in the right place. The Lord had already laid out specific ways that the Ark, Ark of Covenant was to be moved. It was to be moved by the, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the Levites. It was to be placed on their shoulders and carried. That's specific instructions that he gave. They placed the ark on the cart that was carried by oxen. The Lord didn't tell y'all to do that. Mm -mm, he didn't tell you to do that. See, you want to do it your way, there's going to be consequences in you doing it your way. Now, the Lord don't care about you getting mad. David got a little upset. He got over it. In the story in chapter, uh, in 2 Samuel, the sixth chapter, it says, and again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Bali of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God upon new cart. That ain't what he told them to do. And brought it out of the house of Abinadad. Uh, that was in Gilbeah. And uh, Uzzah and Oha, the sons of uh, Abinadad, drave, drave the new cart, and they brought it out of the house of Abinadad, which was in Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God, and Oya 
went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord. See, they're worshiping, aren't they? And all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps and on psalm trees and on tambourines and on carnets and cymbals. They're worshiping the Lord. And then it's beautiful. They worshiping the Lord, but there's one little problem. Wait a minute now. Watch, keep reading. Verse six says, and when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it for the oxen had shook it. See, it almost fell when the oxen had rocked it. And he touched it just to stop it from falling. Verse seven says, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah and God smote him there for his error. And there he died by the ark of God. You say, wait a minute. These people are worshiping the Lord and carrying the ark of God. They got it on the oxen and the thing was about to fall and Uzzah just touched it to stop it from falling. Why the Lord kill him? First of all, the Lord didn't tell you to do it like that. Mm -hmm. You hear what I say? The Lord didn't tell him to do it like that in the first place. David did not consult the Lord this time. Why would the Lord kill Uzzah? David and the people had taken a vote and it seemed like a good thing because democracy had taken over, right? I don't care nothing about democracy. When I hear people talking about democracy, what does God say about it? You hear all these so-called fake conservatives saying, well, we need to compromise about abortion. We need to compromise about homosexuality. We need to compromise about this. Well, what does the word of God say about it? Does he say compromise? Because you can get the votes. Well, see, evidently they took a vote. And they said, it's a good thing you said, David. Let's put the, the, the Ark of the Covenant on the oxen. And we're going to do that, a new court. They were not hurting no one. You ever heard that phrase? They wasn't hurting nobody. They ain't hurting nobody. But the Lord said, you are hurting somebody because I didn't tell you to do it like that. And since they used the de democratic system on agreeing that it was the right thing to do, hey, it's in the Constitution they can do this. They passed the Supreme Court agreed with it. I don't care what the Supreme Court says. Can't nothing about what the Supreme Court says. If it goes against what God says, why did the Lord kill Uzzah. Well, first thing is Uzzah had no business being that close to the ark in the first place. Knock, knock. You wouldn't have been that close, you wouldn't have died. That's why he killed him. And the Lord says, I'm not going to take no uh, uh, prisoners. When I tell you to do it, you're going to do it my way. Secondly, this is one of the rare times David did not ask the Lord for God. That'll get you in trouble. You know, I have, a, have you ever got in trouble by not consulting with the Lord? You come by and you looking all muddy, you beat up and stuff like the little kids I showed that time. They got mud all over their face and stuff. Spirit told you not to go over there. You went over there anyway. You got beat up. Lick your wounds and come back and repent. Then the text says, and David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. And he called the name of the place Peri Uzzah. Uh, 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 Uzzah. That means outbreak against Uzzah. To this day is what it's called. And David was afraid of the Lord. Let's go. There you go, David. He was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how should the ark of the Lord come to me? He said he was afraid. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Some of you ain't got enough fear here. I'm scared. Yes, indeed. I fear the Lord. Now, even though we have a great relationship with the Lord, but don't get it twisted that you think you can play with the Lord. I don't play with the Lord. He ain't to be played with. Now, David is going to pout for a little while, but the Lord does not change his mind because David is pouting. The Lord don't care nothing about you pouting. I think the Lord cares nothing about that. He said, I did do it this way. And you want to do it your way, don't come to me. You can get over that. See, David is a man after God's own heart, but he gonna get, he's a quick learner. Then it says, so David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him and to the city of David, but David carried it aside to the house of uh, Obadam, the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obadam, the Gittite, three months. Watch this. And the Lord blessed Obadam and all his house. So, ooh, you want to be blessed. The presence of the Lord is here. The presence of the Lord is here. The ark of the covenant was at Obadam's house and the presence of the Lord was there. He just started getting blessed. Woo! I bet they was in there just worshiping. I bet you opened them and his whole family was in there just worshiping before the ark of God. The presence of the Lord was there. And it says that it was told to David saying the Lord 
had blessed the house of Obadiah. David said, wait a minute. <laughs> I think I'm done pouting now. And all that pertained unto him because the ark of God is there. So David went and brought the, up, up the ark of God from the house of Obadiah unto the city of David with gladness. David understood that Obadiah was being blessed because of the presence of the Lord. I don't believe this is the only reason David went to get the ark, but he understood now that things must be done the Lord's way, huh? See, a man thinks a whole bunch of things. A woman thinks a whole bunch of things. Well, this is how I see it. This is how I see it. I don't care how you see it. Don't make no difference to me how you see it. Don't make no difference to how I see it. How does the Lord see it? David consulted the Lord, and when we read what happened next in 1 Chronicles chapter 15, it says, For because ye did it not at the first, the Lord our God made a breach upon us. David says, wait a minute. He said, wait a minute. I just read what it said. We did it the wrong way. Let's go back and fix that thing. The people in David were successful in true worship and praise, and that's what broke out. When they was obedient to the Lord, all of a sudden, when they went the second trip to bring the ark in, they didn't have no problems. You know why they didn't have no problems? Because they did what thus says the Lord. It says, and it was so that when they that bear the ark of the Lord had gone six spaces, he sacrificed oxen and fattening. Let's start out like that. Say, so we went six spaces. Stop. Let's do some worship. Come on. Hit the sacrifice. Put the oxen on there. We got the sacrifice. See, Step by step. Remember that song, Order My Steps in Your Word, Dear Lord. Lead me, guide me every day. That's what he was doing. He took a step, he sacrificed. They took some more steps. They said, We're going to do this thing the right way. And we're going to get the Levites to carry this thing. Because it says, David danced before the Lord with all his might. This is, can you imagine if we had a president that was dancing before the Lord? I'm not talking about this foolishness they be doing in church. I'm saying with true worship. It okay to be dancing if you got true worship. And David was girded with a lining epaul. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting, with sounds of trumpet. Some people say you're supposed to be quiet in church. Well, right here, they're not being too quiet. They said this was a rare occasion because the ark was being brought. Are you saying that the Lord don't want you to make no noise? It says make a joyful noise unto the Lord. What you talking about? Not a fake noise, though, a joy for noise. Now, if the joy for noise is going to be fake, keep that to yourself. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, uh, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him and all. She said, would you look at this idiot? Oh, I can't stand. He's embarrassing me. My daddy would have never done that. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in his place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched before it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. Get it right, David. Get it right. David was not concerned about what others thought of him when he was worshiping the Lord. He didn't care who was looking. He didn't say, this seems undignified for me. I don't know if I want to shout for the Lord because some of my very, very distinguished colleagues may see me and think I'm one of those born-again Christians. I, I can't have that. Saul's daughter, who David had married after killing Goliath, that was his prize. Maybe the worst prize he ever got. <laughs> Saul's daughter. <laughs> Saul said, whoever killed Goliath, you can have my daughter. He said, no, no, no. Give me some gold. I don't want her. I don't want her. But he should have said. Listen to what it says about that in chapter 6 of 2 Samuel. Then David returned to bless his household. Look at this. Micah, the daughter of Saul, she waiting on him now. Ooh, she going to give him number two now. She going to give him number attitude now. This man is doing a good thing. He's worshiping the Lord, doing a good thing. Uh-uh. This ain't the kind of wife that you want. It says that Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David. She couldn't wait to meet him. Going to give him a tongue lashing too. She says, how glorious was the king of Israel today who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servant as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovered himself. She said, you disgust me, David. Can I give it in my vernacular? That was you said, you disgust me. And David said to Michael, watch this. David going to do a little sarcasm here. See, I like this fellow, David. He said, it was before the Lord which chose me. Mic drop. Mic drop. 
Woo, David, you ain't had to go there. He even to cut a deep. Watch this. It was before the Lord, which chose me before thy father. Woo. She said, where daddy at now? Mm -hmm. David said, where your daddy at now? He was disobedient. That's right. He chose me. He anointed me. Your daddy is not here because your daddy was hard-headed. He didn't be obedient. But I learned real quick. When I do something wrong, I repent, David saying. And before all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel, therefore will I play before the Lord. So I don't care nothing about what you're saying. I'm going to worship him. And I will yet, watch this. I will yet be more vile than thus. He said, you thought you seen some girl. You ain't seen nothing yet. And will be based in my own sight. He said, I ain't nothing before him anyway. And of the man maid service which thou spoken of, them shall I have had in honor. Mm -hmm. Ooh, David, boy, you talking reckless here. Therefore, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child until the day of her death. Whoop, there it is. God says, you don't need to have no children. Close up the womb. What happened right there? He said, you're going to speak. Don't, he said, don't you deny true worship here. He said, David, my servant, was worshiping him. Mike, you want to talk against that? You ain't having no children. Whoo, that's how the Lord works. Don't think for one minute uh, David was exposed in any kind of way when he was dancing. He had a top layer of clothing, which is described. They think he just danced all out of his clothes. I've heard that before. No, he had clothes on. He had two layers of clothes because if you go read First Chronicles chapter 15, it says, And David was clothed with a robe of fine linen, and all the Levites that bear the ark, and the singers of the Shinonah, and the masters of the song with singers. David also had upon him an ephod of linen, two sets of clothing. David was dressed like a priest and king. Does that sound familiar? David was dressed like a priest and a king, pointing to the office of the Lord Jesus Christ. You, we talked about him over there at Simon the leper's house, the Passover lamb. David was dressed like priest and king. Who did they say like Jesus is in the book of Hebrews? He's a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, having neither beginning or ending. There is a certain order in true worship, and that starts with a right mindset on who Jehovah is. You can't do re true worship if you don't have a mindset of who he is. In our text, we see this beautiful act of worship by Mary. It is a beautiful act, too. It's a sweet-smelling aroma, not a sweat-smelling, but a sweet-smelling. It says, then took Mary a pound of ointment of spinner, very, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus. Watch this, though. She, just said, she didn't just say, I brought the, the oil, the expensive oil I've been waiting and saving for Jesus. After she gave it, she broke it and just, I mean, she didn't just say, I'm going to give him a little dab or something. She broke it and put it all on his head. It ran down to his feet, and she took her hair, and she wiped. Uh, his feet with her hair. You talking about worship. Ooh, somebody said, Mary, don't take all of that, girl. Ooh, look at Mary. I just don't, she just ain't got no shame about herself. Mary said, I don't care who looking. I came to worship him. Remember that old song? I love to praise him. I love to praise his name. I love to praise him. I love to praise. That's what Mary is saying right here. She took her, her hair. Just think about this. She took her hair and she was wiped. Now, the good thing about this is the whole room was smelling sweet. That means because she brought the oil for Jesus and knowing him, you think Mary wasn't smelling good too? The whole room was smelling. And the Lord, I bet that thing went up to heaven, this act of worship. When true worship happens, that means that the Lord is present. That also means that a sweet smell will also permeate the space where the worship is happening. Ooh, you hear what I say? I said when true worship is happening, there's a sweet aroma that permeates the space where the worship is happening. Judas attempted to rebuke Mary, but Jesus comes to her defense. If you go over to Matthew 26, it tells this story. It says, but when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying to what purpose is this waste? Now, maybe Judas has, well, I don't think it was one of the 11, I mean, one of the 12 who said this. You know, Jesus had many people who was disciples following him. So evidently, there were probably some people who Judas was a big shot to. Because there's always 
a, 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 a band of folks who latch on to some scoundrel and start following him. Judas is really saying is that Jesus is not worthy of this expensive ointment, but he is. Judas pretending that he wanted to take care of the poor is laughable. Have you seen these politicians come on TV? We're just trying to take care of the poor. Y'all didn't spend $34 trillion. You should have already paid. You could have gave all the poor a couple of million dollars apiece by now. All they do is talk. And you should have disdain for such corruption if somebody keeps talking about doing something and the situation is getting worse. It reminds me of the woman with the issue of blood. You remember the story? It says that she went to doctor, the doctor, the doctor, the doctor, after she spent all she had. First they said that Instead of getting better, she got worse. But after she spent all she had, the doctor said, we can't help you. Well, you got any more money? Oh, you ain't got no more money? No, we can't help you. Most doctors are not interested in helping you. They're interested in giving you a bunch of drugs. They ain't interested in helping you. I know it's hard for you to swallow. You say it's, that show seems uh, tight, but it's right. Uh, they don't want to help you. Most of them want to help you. Why is there so many sick people? Why is there so many people addicted to all these damn drugs and they ain't doing any good to nobody? Because these doctors have taken an oath, but it ain't an oath to do no harm. It's an oath to harm people, to get people hooked on drugs. Jesus is not that kind of doctor. No, no, no. He's the good doctor, just like he's the good shepherd. John says, not that Judas cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. The Lord Jesus says, for the poor always you have with you. In other words, he says, Judas, if you want to feed the poor, you got them always that money you've been stealing, go feed the poor with that, you thief, you. All these rich politicians never really give to the poor. They take taxpayers' money and act like they're Robin Hood or something. Go give your money to the poor. If I'm going to give something to some poor, I'm going to go give my money. I'm not going to go steal somebody else's money and say, look what I'm doing, all these great things I'm doing to you. No, spend your money. They want to spend everybody else's money and act like they've done something. You got your reward, you thief, you. In Matthew's gospel, it says, why trouble ye the woman? For she had wrought a good work upon me. For ye have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. For in that she had poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. But did you notice how Mary was worshiping? Not only did she bring the anointing oil, but she gave all herself to the Lord. She says, all of me. I think that's a song too, all of me. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spindard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. She took her hair and washed the feet of the Lord Jesus with her hair. You talking about washing feet? Here you go, right? She said, I do it with my hair. Someone is saying in the background, I bet you, Mary, ooh, look at that Mary. Ooh, she's such a show off. Ooh, I just don't like Mary. Ooh, Mary, you need to just sit down, girl. Mary said, I don't care who's looking. I came to worship my Lord because he's worthy, and I brought him a gift, and ain't going to let nobody hinder me from worshiping him. Jesus says when the gospel is preached, it would be a memorial and an act of worship that's dedicated and reminded when you talk about this story. You say, Mary, was that worshiping? True worshiper is a thankful person. Do you hear me? A true worshiper is a thankful person. You want to find a true worshiper, I bet you that person is going to be thankful. There are different times where the Lord Jesus was worshiped in Scripture. True worship will refuse to be stopped because of a difficult situation. A true worshiper says, I will praise and worship until you bless me. There's a story of a Canaanite woman found in Matthew 15. This is not be confused with the woman uh, at the well in Samaria. This is a Canaanite woman. I want to read a little bit of that. It says, Behold, a woman of Cana came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. At least she knows how to address him. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. She said, My child got a devil in him. And I know you're the only one who can get that devil out of my child. Ooh-wee. If you got a child with a devil, I said the Lord is the only one that can bring healing to that child. It's a fact. If you got a child, you got to pray and turn it over to the Lord. And don't pray one time as I asked him one time. That ain't how it works. 
How about keep asking and keep asking, play, uh, begging and pleading? You're going to see in the text, Jesus just don't answer her the first time. How bad do you want it? But he answered her, not a word. He didn't even address her. This woman asked Jesus, you said, that sounds real cruel. That ain't the Jesus I know. See, how bad do you want it? She asked Jesus, that my daughter got a devil in it, and I need you to heal him. She said, he said, the Bible says he didn't even answer the woman. His disciples came and besought him, saying, send her away. She cried after us. Hold on a minute, fellas. She ain't said a word to y'all. She's talking to the master. Somebody try to stop you from talking to the master. You say, get thee behind me, Satan. I'm talking to the master. And they tell me she's, she's crying after us. She ain't studying y'all. She's talking to the master. He's the one who came to set the captive free. But he answered and said, watch this. I am not sent but into the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshiped him. Knock, knock. What happened then? After he said this, she came and worshiped. Wait a minute, woman. Did you hear what he says? He says he ain't hooking you up today because he only came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She didn't let that deter her. The scripture says she came and worshiped him, says, Lord, help me. Watch out. Watch out now. She says, I'm going to do some worship, but I need your help, Lord. I need some help. But he answered and said, watch this. It's not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to the dog. You say, well, that sounds real harsh. Understand he's talking about the strays, those who are not part uh, 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 of the true Israel, what he's saying. And she said, true, Lord. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. This woman is not going to, she said, my child is sick. I don't care nothing about this political correct stuff. I don't care about you trying to hurt my feelings. I'm going to come get my blessing. Then Jesus answered, watch this, and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from the very first hour. See, if she had came to Jesus and she said, my feelings got hurt and left, her daughter still would have had the devil. How bad do you want it, huh? Jesus didn't even have to go. He says, this happened. I, I just bless you. Go in peace. Your daughter is healed. But she was, she, she learned to worship first. And after she learned to worship, she wasn't so easily offended. Our problem is we so easily offended that we can't even get a blessing. I don't like the way the Lord doing it. He don't care what you like. David potted for a little while. But when David understood that the Lord is not going to conform to you, David, you're going to conform to the Lord. Everything was all right. Look, the ark came in. He did his dancing. The Lord didn't allow uh, Saul's daughter to have any children by him, which may be a blessing also. Uh, the same thing in this particular story we just read. This woman wanted her child delivered. And she says, I'm going to hold on to your blessing, Lord. Now, in closing, I want to look at uh, something in, in John chapter 9. Some of you are familiar with it, but we're going to read through it and we're going to dissect it a little bit because we talk about worship. Now, problem with some people is that they don't think the Lord has done anything for them. That's why they can't conduct themselves in true worship because they don't understand all the things the Lord has done for them. Every day, new mercy is given unto you. You wake up, you have food, you have shelter, you have water. You're blessed, but you don't even know it. You're so busy complaining that you can't even be blessed. People got it way worse than you. I'm not saying you got all you want, but I mean, you could be way worse than what you got right now. I guarantee you can. There's a bunch of people who would love to trade places with you. Now, if you look over in John chapter 9, it says, and as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. Watch this. He saw a man. The man didn't see him. He's blind. You understand that? I found Jesus. I thought you was blind. How can a blind person, the blind man didn't see Jesus. Jesus saw the blind man. You said, I was looking for the Lord. You blind. You weren't looking for the Lord. He found you. He found you. And then it says, watch what his disciples, they're going to jump to conclusions. Whenever somebody go through something bad, the first thing somebody said, well, see, that's because the Lord is cursing them. Every time somebody go through something bad, doesn't mean the Lord is cursing them. It could be that the Lord is preparing them for a blessing. He's preparing them. He's preparing me. And his disciples asked him saying, Master, who did sin? This man or his parents that he was born blind. Who this man? Sound like a uh, hoppo. Who this man? <laughs> did this man sin or his parents? And he said somebody had to do something because he's blind. It's obvious that his parents did something wrong or this fella did something. How did he do something wrong if he was born blind though? <laughs> 
unless they didn't know he was born blind. Jesus answered, neither have this man sinned nor his parents. That don't mean they didn't commit sin. He was saying that the, the, sin, that, 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 that the blindness is not a cause from sin. I guess in a roundabout way, he's saying not a specific sin. We know the fall is what caused all type of disease, but he's saying nothing specific happened to cause this man to be uh, blind, but the works of God should be made manifest. He said God is about to get uh, the glory out of this man's blindness. Huh? God can get glory out of your blindness. Yeah, I'm talking to you. Then the master says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night coming when no man can work. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. When he had thus spoke, he spat on the ground, made clay of the spittle, and anointed the man's eyes uh, with the clay. Now, you said that's unorthodox. I don't think I want that blood that him spitting on the ground. I don't think I want that on my eyes. Jesus, could you do it another way? Because I don't think I like that way right there you doing it. You blind, shut up. Here you are trying to tell the master how to bless you, how to deliver you. You don't need no help. You be quiet, you clay you. You be quiet, you blind person you. You're trying to show the master who gives sight to the blind how to hear you. If you want to spit on the ground and put clay in your eyes, you shut up. You just take your healing. And he said unto him, go wash in the pool of Salaam. And he went his way therefore and washed and came back seeing. Are you surprised? We're going to get, we going somewhere. We're going to get to the worship report, but are you surprised? The Lord told you to do something. He did what the Lord told him to do. Boom. He got the blessing, right? Isn't that strange how that worked when you do what the Lord said do? He may not come when you want him to come. Don't worry about that. You ain't ready for it yet. That's why he ain't came yet. The neighbors, therefore, they which before had seen him that he was blind. He says, uh, wait a minute. Is this the fella? I uh, says, uh, is that the fella who was sitting over there begging all the time? Look kind of like him. Some said, this is he. Others said, He's kind of look like him, but I'm not sure because that fella is blind. So this couldn't be him because this is a different fella. And they said to him, uh, wait a minute, are you that fella that was blind? How was it that your eyes were open? Because he, when they were just talking amongst themselves, why he's standing right there? He says, this is me. Yeah, it's me. I'm the fella that was blind. It is me. They said, well, how did you get your eyes open then? He answered and said, a man that is called Jesus, put a period right there. Did you hear what I say? A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go wash in the pool of Siloam. I washed, I went away and washed, I came back seeing. He said, simple as that. They said, wait a minute. There's gotta be more to this story than that. Wait a minute. Hold on a minute. You've been blind since birth. This fella just comes up and just spit on the ground, put some clay on you, tell you to go wash and you was obedient and you came back seeing? I don't know if that right there. I don't think we believe you. He said, where is he at anyway? Where's this Jesus fella at? He said, I don't know where he at. All I know is I got my healing. So they said, wait a minute, we need to take him over to the Pharisees so they can examine him. Why are you taking him to the Pharisees when they ain't, bring, they ain't giving nobody sights? They ain't doing no healing. But you're going to take him to the Pharisees. You know why? Because a bunch of you like these fake preachers who ain't doing nothing to deliver anybody. Not in spirit, not in mind, or nothing. Matter of fact, they put you more in abundance. And you are one going over, Bishop such and such. Oh, this is Bishop such and such. Bishop such and such is a fraud. He ain't never healed anybody. He ain't never delivered nobody. Matter of fact, the bishop is in bondage. How the bishop going to deliver you when the bishop is in bondage? These Pharisees was in bondage. That's why Jesus says, be careful of the leaving of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Their teaching is hypocrisy. So he took them to the to, to the Pharisees, and it was the Sabbath day. Uh oh! Somebody said, "Uh oh!" It was the Sabbath day. Now this man been born blind. They're worrying about the Sabbath day. Now if they had a donkey or an ox that got uh, trapped in the in, in, in somewhere. They would go release them, and that would be considered as work on the Sabbath too. But this born man, born blind, we can't have this. Stay blind. That's what they wanted him to do. Said so it was a Sabbath. Jesus made the clay, opened up his eyes. Then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said unto them, he, meaning Jesus, put clay upon my eyes, and I wash, and I see. He said, this is very simple. This ain't complicated. You don't need a PhD. <laughs> you 
You don't need to go to the seminary school to figure this out. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God because he keeping out the Sabbath day. You can cannot believe these fake, fake, fake church folks. He just healed a man who was born blind and they tell me he ain't keeping the Sabbath. You can't make it up. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. Others says, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? Good question. That was my question. You took the words right out of my mouth. They said, so that was a division amongst them. They said unto the blind man again, they said, wait a minute, let's examine this fellow again. Maybe he made a mistake, he misspoke. What says thou of him that he opened thine eyes? He said, he is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind. They said, wait a minute, maybe this fellow is lying to us. And all the people who brought him, they lying to us too. <clears throat> Tell you what we do, let's go get his parents. Now you're going to see worship. I know we're talking about worship. You got to wait for it. They said, let's go get his parents. Now, this is the sad part. This is such a sad part of a story to me. That when his parents showed up, they said, we need to go ask his parents, is this their son and was he born blind? They said, uh, is this your boy? Mm -hmm. I said, let's call him Blind Bartimaeus. <laughs> is this your boy? Yeah, that's our son. Uh-huh. Um, that's old bar. Uh-huh. That's our boy. Yes, he is. Uh, was he born blind? Yes, that, yes, he was born blind. Okay, then. Could you explain to us how has he now got his sight? Now, didn't this grown man just say he, what happened? And I'm sure some other witnesses was there and told them, they said, let's get the parents in here because we got to distort the truth. Does this sound familiar to anyone? We don't want the facts. We don't want to let all the facts come out in a trial. Oh, no, 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 no. We can't have that. Let's have a mock trial and pretend like we're looking for facts. Let's get the parents in here and let's ask the parents, uh, this is your boy, right? Yes. Was he born blind? Yes. How did he receive his sight? They said to them, watch this. His parent answers, we know that this is our son, that he was blind, but by what means he now see it, we know not. Wait a minute. You mean your boy didn't tell you what happened? I think he already told him what happened because I know the first thing he should have ran home. Mom and dad, I can see. Now, he's a grown man now. But when you think he'd have told his parents what happened? Because first thing I would ask, how did this happen? You mean to tell me his parents don't know? They're so scared of these phony church people because they want to be a part of the fake church. You should want to be a part of the fake church because these are fakes. These are frauds. These are phony. They says uh, you need to... Uh, Tell us how he got his son. They say, you know what? He's of age. Why don't you ask him? He can speak for himself. But we ain't going to speak on this because we don't want to get thrown out of the synagogue. You can't make this stuff up. Your boy been blind all his life. He get his sight and you worried about being thrown out of the synagogue. Throw me out the synagogue then. So he's of age. You can let him speak for himself. Then again, they called him. Hey, get him back in here. I think we didn't intimidate him. We didn't call him. Now he's going to be intimidated now. One thing I can understand when somebody got true worship in their heart, you're not going to discourage them to go against the Lord when they know what he's done for them. They try to bring him back in and they thought they were going to say, give God the praise. We know this man is a sinner. They're trying to intimidate him now. When you know what the Lord has done for you, can't nobody intimidate you. Now, don't you let nobody stop you from serving him after you know what he done done for you, what he done brought you to. He answers says, whether he be a sinner, watch this fella. I like this fella. Oh, I like this fella right here. He's adamant about it. They finna get mad at him now. They said, whether he, he said, whether he be a sinner or no. He said, I don't know if you, you can call it what you want to. One thing I know that I once was blind, now I see. Sing Amazing Grace, brother. He said, you can talk all this other fancy stuff all you want to talk. All I know is, I know for a fact I was blind. Last week I was blind. Last year I was blind. The year before that I was blind. The year before that I was blind. I've been blind all my life. And I was blind to this fella called Jesus showed up, spit on the ground, made clay, told me to go wash. I once was blind. Now I see. Bam. Mic drop. I don't got no time to keep talking y'all. Y'all upset. Then they asked him a question. They said, okay, then let's ask you some more questions. What did he do to thee? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I've told you already, and you did not hear me. He said, yo, you hard of hearing? What, what is part of your brain that you don't not register what I'm saying? You guys are supposed to be really, really educated. He said, you, 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 wherefore would ye hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? This is when they're going to get mad now. He said, y'all, 
The blind man said, the formerly blind man said, y'all want to be his disciples too? Because I'm thinking about it because this fella got it going on. Then it, this, this is when they get upset now. See, this is when the Holy Rose will get upset and try to remind you something you did bad. Because they're, they got filthy hearts and they don't want to repent either. But they want to pretend like they're true worshipers when they're not. They then reviled him and says, there are his disciples, but we are Moses disciples, Moses disciples. I bet they got real distinguished too. We are Moses disciples. We know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. The man answered and said unto them, watch this. Now he's going to start mocking them. I love this. <laughs> I love this. You, sometimes when you read the Bible, it's got a sense of humor. He says, why herein is a marvelous thing. It's marvelous. The fellow said, this is marvelous then. That ye know not from whence he is, and yet he had opened my eyes. <laughs> he says, y'all don't know where he came from or who he is, but all I know is this right here. Ain't now one of y'all. He didn't say not none of y'all. He said, not now one of y'all. Not now one of y'all has been able to heal me. Matter of fact, y'all ain't never even talked to me. This fella just calls me out and tells me to go wash. So it's funny that y'all don't know who he is and where he came from, but I know this for a fact. I once was blind, now I see. Now we know that God, this is why he's going to preach to him now. He said, now we know that God here and not sinners. Are you referring to this fella being a sinner when he opened blinded eyes? But if any man be a worshiper, that is, if any man be a worshiper of a God and do it his will, him he hear it. Wait a minute. Being a worshiper of God makes him hear you? Did you hear what this blind, this boy is preaching now. Since the world began, he says, was it not heard that a man opened the eyes of one that's been born blind? He said, y'all ain't never heard nothing like this. What, what manner of man is this? Why well, ain't never seen nothing like this before? I was blind. He said, show it to me. Show me anywhere in history. He said, but the reason that the Lord is here in this fellow because he's a true worshiper. I want to become a true worshiper. If this man were not of God, he would do nothing. They answered and said unto him, thou was altogether born in sin. They said, you sinner, you. And do as thou teach us. They cast him out. They get out of here. Coming here telling us nothing about no Jesus, about how he is. We don't want to hear that. I want you to tell us how bad he is and how wonderful we is. Other than that, you sinner, you, you wretched sinner, you, you got a lot of nerve trying to lecture us holy rollers. We will not listen to your lecture. Jesus heard, watch this. I like this. Jesus heard that they had cast them out. Jesus says, okay. <laughs> when you get put out of fake churches, that's okay. And when he had found him, he said in him, do as thou believe on the Son of God. Knock, knock. Believe on the Son of God. Jesus said, we got to get here now. We got to, we got to straighten your doctrine up now, fella. Do you believe in the Son of God? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light. No man comes unto the Father but by him. Jesus asked the blind man, the formerly blind man, who got kicked out of the Son of God, do as you believe in the Son of God. Watch this. The fella says, who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? Jesus said to him, Thou hast both seen him, and is he that is talking in thee. You know, it's only two times in the Bible. I mean, Jesus told other people that he was Messiah, but it was two times he was emphatic. It was the woman of Samaria when he says, The one you've been waiting for, the Messiah you've been waiting for, I'm here. With this fellow, he says, uh, Do you believe in the Son of God? And he says, I need to... I need to get to know it. I mean, if you tell me who it is, I'll do it. He says, the one you talking to, the one you looking at, I'm the son of God. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worship him. That is, whoop, that is, he worship him. See, this is the mindset of uh, Mary. See, he understood, this fellow understood that the true way to enter into his presence is through worship. Now, you better make sure you got your doctrine right because don't you create a God in your own image and says, I'm worshiping the God of the Bible, but it ain't the God of the Bible you worship because he has specific uh, characteristics about himself. This man's learned to worship the Lord after he opened up his eyes. The Lord hears the voice of true worshipers. We can learn a lot from Mary's act of worship. She wanted to worship the master on who he was. 
Not that the price was the most important thing of the, uh, of the oil that she had. She must have been saving to buy this. But the main purpose of her act of worship is to give the Lord the praise that is due to him. That's how you should understand it. True worship brings with it a sweet smelling aroma. Yes, it does. True wor worship brings with it a sweet smell aroma. Not sweat now. It's a sweet smell aroma. And once you understand that you came to worship him, you ain't got to worry about what everybody else is doing. You don't have to be concerned. See, the problem with a lot of people who be tripping over things, that's what the psalmist was said in Psalm 73, my feet, feet almost slip paying attention to the wicked. Don't worry about the wicked. You said they getting blessed. They got money. It could be a curse to them. Money is a great, great servant, but it's a poor, poor master. Problem is that money is the master of most people who have it. God don't mind you having money. But if it's going to become your master, it'd be better if you did without it, if it's going to become your master, because your master will beat you like you are a Hebrew slave. That's what uh, mammoth or money will do for you if you don't know how to control it, because you'll start worshiping and thinking that the money can stop you. There's a bunch of people with money that's miserable. Some of them are sick. Some of them don't have peace of mind. They can't even sleep without taking tons and tons of medicine. So how free are they? But true worship brings with it a sweet smell and aroma. It actually brings with it inner peace. That's what true worship does. Now, if you want inner peace, you must learn to be a true worshiper. And if you are a true worshiper, the Lord will always lead and guide you into victory. But learn to be a true worshiper first. And once you learn to be a true worshiper, then you will learn how to praise him and have peace of mind. That doesn't mean all your problems go away. All your problems do not go away just because you become a believer, but you can learn to have peace in spite of issues or problems. You learn to have peace and you learn to have peace by entering to his gates with thanksgiving. Learn to praise him even when things are not going that well. Thank him anyway because you still got a lot to be thankful for. You can say things could be better. Of course they could, but they could be a whole lot worse too. Learn to worship him in spirit and in truth. And then you will learn uh, to be a genuine worshiper. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for your many blessings that you bestowed upon us. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who died for our sins that we may not have to suffer in eternity. We pray right now that you will cleanse our hearts and our mind. Let us become true worshipers those who worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we pray for those in the common sense nation. We pray and cover them in your prayer. Lord, we pray that you bless them and they're going in and they're going out. Lord, we pray that you bless them physically and mentally. We pray, Lord, that you will let your spirit rain down on them. Give them an inner peace. Lord, we thank you for Brother Hamp. We thank you that he's doing better. We ask you to bless him. We are still praying for his grandson. We pray, Lord, that things would be better in that situation. Lord, we are still praying about it, and we know you are well able to do what you said you would do. Lord, we pray again for Caroline's daughter. She's been hooked on drugs. We pray, Lord, that you would bless her, and we cover her, Lord. Give her the right mind. Take away that craving that she has in, Lord, and bring her home safely. Lord, we pray for all those saints who may be suffering. We pray for those who may be going through trials and tribulation, Lord. We thank you for all the blessings that you've bestowed upon us, and we praise your holy name, and we ask you to teach us how to worship you in a way that is more pleasing to you. It is in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you guys, and thank you guys for all your support. Uh, thank you for those who have... Uh, kept us abreast and, and, and gave to us. Give a great big thank you again to Christy Meadows who gave us a great contribution uh, on our PayPal. God bless you and bless all those who support us. But if you're just passing our material around, thank you for that. If you're telling somebody about us, thank you for that. And I want us to continue in prayer. We want to be a, a, a people who pray uh, for one another and that's our job. We should pray 
for one another that we should become strong because if you're planning on spending eternity uh, in heaven, uh, you should be uh, understanding that you're going to be with these saints. There's going to be some relatives that's blood related to you ain't going to heaven. But the saints who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will spend eternity with those particular people. God bless you and God keep you and stay strong out there. God bless you, Brittany. My sister, thank you for your encouragement. God bless you, Hamp, Caroline, uh, Sweet Clever, Christy Meadows, my brother JLC, Lisa Bates, uh, my, my brother Eric, uh, Howard, God bless you, uh, Hamp. Uh, did I miss anybody who came in earlier? I think I got everybody. God bless you guys. Stay strong out there. The Lord is still in charge. But remember, we got to learn to have that joy in our heart. And that joy sometimes will send. If you learn to praise him in times of trouble, you will praise your way through things.